Excellent. Let us go ahead and get ourselves started tonight. Today I actually want to try and like unify a lot of the little things we've been talking about in little pieces and bits. And uh, like try and kind of uh, kind of a better framework behind it to give you some guidance on how to actually start approaching this project. Because the project actually really is kind of a big thing that we're gonna keep on following through many weeks and throughout the entire like a quarter. But there are really some things that we can do to just get started with thinking about the building envelope that don't really involve designing the entire building. There's really some stuff we can do um, to really just look at pieces of the project specifically about the envelope. And we're going to look at some of those things today. We really kind of look at almost the notion of doing wall sections for specific pieces of the building that would apply to different sides of the building depending upon what we're trying to accomplish. But those will almost exist independent of what's happening in your bigger building. Because, you know, designing the entire center all at once, there's a lot of work in that. And, you know, you know, you don't necessarily have to have your entire concept looking great by Tuesday. There's you know, some general ideas that we're going to apply to. We're just going to keep on working it very iteratively. You know, it's a little, for people who are used to design studios, that's actually a comfortable concept. If you're used to sort of more engineering problem sets, that's a little uncomfortable. Because you're going to turn into something, or not even turn it, we're going to be looking at something together that's inherently not done. And that's OK. It's just part of a step along the process. So. Hopefully for the architecture students, they'll be very familiar. Kind of every desk grid is kind of that way. You know, for the engineering students, hopefully we'll get you past that. You know, I'm good. You don't have to come up with complete finished design to do things. You're just kind of like that. You a step along uh, a path heading in a direction. Today, what we're going to look at in trying to unify some things together is just some general principles about the site design. Think about that. You'll uh, really kind of pull together some order to the whole notion of passive solar design, especially this whole notion of glazing and windows and how it all works together. And I was really struck, I have to confess, on Tuesday evening as I stepped around for uh, the office hours for the you know energy efficient buildings class and was watching people play with e class about just how confusing all this stuff gets to be. It really is so intertwined and you think you're changing one thing, it's going to have a positive effect, and it actually ends up having a negative effect. Or it has a different effect of what you would expect. That it really, it, it takes some kind of unpacking to really think about what the effect of uh, shading is versus low E glass versus triple plane glass versus, there's all these different sort of things that we toss around and we think we're going to understand the effects, but it's actually pretty complex. So uh, hopefully try to like that, put some order in that. Okay. We're also going to start taking a look at the whole notion of, for the bigger building, independent of the uh, you know, issues around the energy efficiency, just as we start laying out a building, we'll start with this whole notion of egress, and really for any building of any size, how we have to start thinking about that systematically in terms of where the exits will be, where the core will be, and really what the requirements are relative. Because there's actually some very specific code requirements that are going to dictate some of those things. So we're going to head down that path. Okay. In terms of what we're doing today, I have actually posted on coursework several PDFs, which are sort of very good resources we'll go ahead and share with you from a book that I absolutely love. That, you know, there's no textbook for this course, but if you were going to go ahead and buy any sort of book, there's a really good one that I'll kind of show you in just a second. And I will apologize that the software on these machines, at least the Autodesk software, and the licensing of that's not working today still. You know, I was upstairs kind of talking to folks about getting the ports fixed. It may actually start working at some point during the class, because there's something that they have to turn on in the computer system to make it work. Yeah. If you have your own computer, please feel free to download the file, follow along, and you know, do it on your own computer. It actually sort of demonstrates a point that I'd, I'd kind of like to reinforce, really, that you know, in general, with all these building modeling tools and stuff like that, it really does pay to go ahead and have your own notebook that has all the software installed on it, so you have a little bit of independence. Because honestly, with all these rooms, you're never quite sure if you're going to have access to the machines, if the software is going to be working. You know, if you're going to be in this kind of design work, just having your own machine that has the software installed is a very good thing to do. So if nothing else this weekend, I highly encourage if you haven't had a chance to install some software and put it on your machines, go ahead and do that. It just, you know, it'll give you a level of independence so we'll never have to worry about whether things are working in this room. Actually, I'm looking out there, I see a several uh, notebooks kind of hiding behind the bigger screen. So you guys are actually doing pretty good. If you are equipped that way, Good for you. If you haven't done it that way, please, please, please think about it. Because it actually uh, it puts you in very good stead for continuing to go. Okay, on coursework, if you want to get going in terms of uh, just following along, you can follow along with this stuff. Go ahead and in session six, there's really several different PDFs I've uploaded there for you. 
um, talking about passive design principles, windows and glazing, and finally, about the egress issues, which we'll talk about the third part of the class. Um, if you want to follow along on your computer and Revit, go ahead and download session six start if you want to, or just kind of work with the building you were working with last night. It's just the building where we sort of finished up last night, and you kind of use it to start thinking about cutting some wall sections and how we can model some of the principles that we talk about relative to passive design in the computer modeling software. So some easy ways and ways that work better than others. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive on here. Does that sort of make sense as a general agenda? If, you, if you're here and you're like, need to work on the computer, that's okay. You can stick around. <laughs> but no worries. We don't take it personally. Okay, let me go ahead and get something started, and we'll see if we can make this work. Hang on. I want to go way back to the top and start back here. Let's start with that. Okay, this is the book that I highly recommend that I've kind of copied some sections out for you to take a look at. It's called Building Construction Illustrated. It's by Francis Ching, incredible architectural illustrator. He has many, many books talking about all sorts of aspects of structural design, architectural design. It is like a you know, fantastic author. You know, there's one book I have in my library as a class. I definitely consider buying this one on Amazon or wherever you want to. It's like a, a really good book. In terms of what we're going to be looking at today, we're going to be looking at kind of the side issues, passive design, windows, skylights, and ultimately finishing with egress. That's kind of the roadmap for where we're going. And just starting with the whole issue of site, let me go ahead and kind of pop over and start looking at some of the uh, different considerations that we need to start thinking about. In terms of the site, you know, we have a little bit of a hillside site to work with. And hillsides are a little bit special. There's all sorts of stuff about hillsides in terms of how the wind crests over the hill and how that affects our ventilation. Yeah, there's also this whole issue about just rainwater and the hydrology and how that is ultimately kind of channeled down the hill that we'll ultimately have to kind of think about relative to our building. But what I really want to focus on first is really just this kind of notion right here, that in terms of addressing the hillside, there's a couple of ways you can do it, a couple of classic categories. And you don't have to decide right away how you're going to do it, but think ahead a little bit how you might approach that. Sometimes when we're working on a hillside, we basically elevate the building on piers or something that will kind of have it float above the entire site. And that's kind of a perfectly valid strategy. It leaves sort of a space underneath, okay, which yeah, has pluses and minuses to it. Another way to do it is to, oh, just completely or almost completely submerge the building in the hillside. Sometimes we go for these underground buildings that are sort of exposed to light on site, but covered with earth. But probably the most common way we address it is something like this one, the one in the middle where there's a part of the building which is exposed to the side and has the view and looks out over, kind of looks downhill. But there are other parts of the building which are either recessed in or even carved into the side where if we want to have light and kind of a nice space on this side, we can even create really terraces or kind of submerged patios, things like that, where ultimately you just need to hold back using retaining walls and a little bit of the site to go ahead and create that space. Okay. Just you know, follow that away as food for thought. Just in thinking about your building, being on the site doesn't mean that all the action has to be down on the downhill side. You can actually do interesting things on the uphill side. We just need to, as you think about the building, think about how the layers are going to work together. Maybe if it steps down the side and the lower layers down here. Oh, even the upstairs or you know the upper part isn't necessarily the roof. It could be a roof terrace or a, some sort of like a nice outdoor space. So a lot of interesting sites are really you know, hillside sites are really quite nice about what they allow you to do and create a very interesting architectural experience. So file that one away because you're going to be using that a little bit later. In terms of thinking about just the passive design principles, you know, we've started out looking at things like this. There's this whole notion of the solar heliodon and how we sort of work with it. And I've kind of brought that up a couple times within Revit, but I want to actually kind of show you a netted capability of it because I sort of stumble around looking at specific things, but it's really a very powerful tool. It's in all the tools, ultimately. Ecotech has it, Revit has it, Masari has it, we all have it. But let me just show you just sort of another sort of feature to it because Understanding how the sun works, you know, I keep on doing these little snapshots at points in time, but you can actually have it do animations that kind of sweep through entire periods of time. And that's actually really a lot more informative. Thank you for reminding me, because it really is kind of a good way of looking at it. So I'm going to switch over to Revit for just a second and uh, kind of take a look at that. 
So here we are. This is the building that I sort of finished up with last time, and that's the section box. Let me just kind of close that up. We don't need to look at that right now. Okay. Right now you see there are some shadows cast at some point in time. We're not really sure what the point in time is. It's just some point in time. Um, what we can do is we can go to these settings and we can adjust the sun settings. So the sun settings can be determined either in this dialog Okay. or they can be determined by sort of moving that little helia down around. And most commonly, we tend to look at this thing as a single day. So I'm looking at it in June. I'm looking at it in December, kind of at a specific point in time. Again, don't get worried about the fact that it says 2010. Hopefully, the sun is staying in the same place in the sky every year. We can argue about that, but we're hoping it's doing that, and that's not really going to be an issue to us. So we can choose sort of a specific time. Yeah, there is a single point in time. Still, okay, which is a single point in time, a single day says, hey, let's not just go ahead and look at 10 a.m. Let's look at what happens to the sun from 10 to 4 or sunset to sun or sunrise to sunset and kind of look at that. So we could choose a specific point in time like 10 to 4. We can just say 4 sunrise to sunset, which will look it up for this particular day and time. And then we can say, really, how often do we want to look at this? If we were going to take a series of snapshots and tie them together in our animation, how often do we want to see? Every hour, if we did it every hour, we'd get 15 different slices here in the middle of June. It'd be shorter in December. If you want to look at it every half an hour, just really, how often do you want to look at it? OK, now we'll get more. So when you go through and you set up not a single day, but or a, a still, Time, but you actually set up an entire day, we get a slightly different set of options. Let me kind of show you what they look like. So here we are. Down here, I can go ahead and show the sun path or not. The sun path really just turns on or turns off that heliodon. So there is the heliodon. You can sort of see it kind of in June with the arc of the sun is going to be. Here we are at the lowest point right at sunrise right now. We can go through and say that we want to preview a solar study. And a solar study is really just a series of shots that we want to bring all together. So I'll say preview it. Here we are at the beginning. I can say play. And it'll just walk through and show you kind of what that sun path is throughout the entire day. So it's sort of a very useful thing to be able to capture because it's actually, you know, quite informative to start to see here we are in June really how sun's going to hit that building at different times of the day. So here we are we can go ahead and look at the exterior of the building. You could also just see how the building shadow how the shadows are being cast throughout the building. So we're not getting much sun at all right now. But you can sort of see how that light's going to move through the building. And it's going to be accurate for the windows, the skylights, all those different features are going to cast that sun accurately in terms of what's going on. I could kind of section through the building and sort of see more intensely. Or I could even do something like this. Let me go to level one. And I will, in the same sense, oops, I don't want to zoom. Zoom to fit. Come back out. What I want to do is put a camera in there, just because I sort of like to sort of see how things are going to look from a perspective standpoint. So here's what my space looks like on the inside right now. Let me shade that. It'll be a little bit easier. See what's going on. So it's going to look something like this in that same sense. I can say, that's going to take it for a single day, sunrise to sunset. Say OK to that. Then I will. That's interesting. I want to be able to preview that, but it's not letting me do that there. Why not? Single day. I think it should let me do that. I wonder if it won't let me do that in terms of a perspective view. That's an interesting thing if it won't let me do it that way. It's entirely possible. Who knows? Interesting. Okay. Forget doing it from a perspective view. It'll work for the 3D view from the other perspective. I'll leave it at that. that hmm. Somehow that baffles me in terms of doing that. Could you just try that and sort of see if you can get it to work? Because I don't, yeah, I'm used to sort of, uh, I think of that wanting to work. But it could just be uh, my imagination. I want to be able to, oh, we'll go back to the 3D on the outside. The interesting thing about the sun is not only does it sort of change quite a bit throughout the day, it actually changes quite a bit throughout the year. So this is one that I think is always sort of very interesting. 
We say that, oh, you know, we optimize for, oh, 10 in the morning or something like that. But it's interesting to see how different 10 in the morning looks at different times of the year. So if you want to do something like that, what you can do is sun settings. And we'll say a multi-day study. So, oh, I'll just make it in September, something like that. Actually, no, I take that back. It's going to let me just do run it all year. I'll do a one-year study. Okay. I get to sort of say, oh, what am I going to do there? Um, how often I am going to do it once per day or every hour. I can sort of choose sunrise, sunrise to sunset, sort of will do the entire time. Um, let me do it another way. Let me go ahead and do it once per day. But I'll do us do it at like 10 a.m. So 10 a.m. I'll just say that I want to do it once per day. And let's see if we can apply that. That should, oh, no, one day. Oh, it's because up here now, this is not set to 1231. Beautiful, they give us 365 frames. Let's take a look at that. So this is kind of what's going to be happening. This is the sun at 10 a.m. kind of moving through the year. This, oh, it's almost like an infinity symbol. What do you call that? It's, uh, there's a name for that. It's like a figure eight. It's basically showing the, where the path, where the sun is going to be at 10 through different times of the year. And let's kind of see what that actually looks like uh, running the study. So here we are at 10. I'll say preview that study. And we'll run it. And you can hardly see the shadow. Actually, 10 is not a great time because the shadow is sort of disappearing between the building on this side. You can sort of see as we start moving through the year, we're in March right now, the shadow is changing. You can start to see a little bit of difference. I should zoom in there a little bit closer so you can see better. What's going on? Let me go ahead and just escape to pause out of that. And even in here, let me orbit that around so we get sort of a better view of what's going on. Okay, so I'll run it again. So you see, just as we move through the year, that shadow actually starts creeping quite a bit. So by the time we're actually getting, oh, towards uh, late in the spring, you're going to see the shadows are actually getting very, very shallow because the sun's getting to be very high in the sky. As we move away and we start moving back into uh, the fall months, after we get past the uh, solstice, okay, that shadow is actually going to start creeping back out again. So it's just useful to kind of be able to look at things like this. And if you have a solar study and you want to be able to go through and share this, it's actually very easy to do. Once you've gone through and created some sort of animation like this, if you'd like to share it, you can just sort of say export. And one of the things that you can export is an animation. So what will that do? That'll create a little AVI, a little movie file for you. So if you want to kind of save that and be able to show someone really quickly what the effect is of the sun, either on a specific day or throughout the year, go ahead and do that. OK. But let's go back over to the principles. So it all starts with, OK, here's that whole notion of you know, how the sun's moving through the sky and the different times. The solstice just being extremes, the equinoxes being theoretically like where you have the same amount of daylight and uh, kind of darkness <laughs> happening in March and September. I thought this, this next data I thought was kind of interesting. Let me pop on down here. This actually shows really what the effect is though of this uh, relative to different locations, at least in the US. And it's kind of interesting. In terms of a very southern place like Phoenix, which is at 32 degree latitude, you start seeing that the sun is in the sky at uh, 34 degrees, so it's still relatively high up in terms of the altitude at noon on these different days, or 58. This is like, uh, what is the altitude? So relative to zero, kind of sweeping the arc up, 90 would be straight up. So the sun is relatively high in the sky, kind of closer to that equator. If we were right on the equator in Singapore and in Ecuador, it'd actually be very close to, you know, 70 or 80, it's pretty high up there. Okay, where by the time you get up to Seattle or a northern uh, latitude, it stays very low in the sky. So, kind of 
amazing how big a difference that is. The difference between uh, you know high in the sky and low in the sky, that's pretty dramatic in terms of what the sun angle is, and that in turn is going to say an awful lot about um, these little roof overhangs and these shading devices and really what the angle of the sun is that's going to be uh, hitting the building and how deep they have to be relative to that. Yeah. Higher in the sky, don't need as much. Lower in the sky, need more. If you were trying to shade and keep that light out. Let's pop over here. There's some interesting stuff in all these documents in this book that talk about just solar radiation and kind of how you might want to orient a building relative to whether you have a cool, a temperate, a hot, a hot, humid, you know, hot, yeah, hot air. It's, it's really, there's different things that you try to maximize for each of those different things that sort of trade off the temperature and trade off the radiation you're capturing. And there's some general guidance about kind of thinking about how to orient a building to try and get the most meta, ma, maximum benefit from the sun. This is kind of, sort of a nice graphic that sort of integrates some things together. This just talks about if you really want to create a space which is good from a passive solar standpoint, some of the principles you'd like to incorporate there. And really, the big thing that you really want to try and capture and use the solar energy in a positive way to try and help heat a space what you need to start thinking about is on the south, because that's what's going to do you the good. Okay. Daylighting doesn't help you in terms of gathering heat. Daylighting is good from the north side. It's very good in terms of lighting space, but it's not going to help you in terms of the heat. We need to get the radiation from the sun rays coming in. We'll need to have some sort of clear surface as one possibility so that either on the roof or on the wall, the rays can get in and hit. We also need some sort of thermal mass okay, to really make it effective. So, we need a concrete floor, we need some tile, we need a concrete wall. We need something that's going to absorb all that radiation and act as a battery and then re-radiate it out through the day. Or through the night, optimally, in terms of what's going on. Yeah, so you need all those different pieces to sort of uh, make the solar radiation work for you. So, you know, the clear, so you can go ahead and capture the radiation or get it into the space, then you need the battery. If you don't have the battery, if you don't have the thermal mass, It'll temporarily warm things up, but it will dissipate very, very quickly because as soon as that heat can conduct out through the walls or get ventilated out, it will. It won't continue to re radiate. Okay, so it's nice to think about kind of concrete and these heavy materials and how they can be used for us. Okay, then you have this whole notion of really how are we going to try and capture that gain, either bringing the light in, hitting the surface, and letting it re radiate directly. Or this is kind of a very interesting uh, principle that when we're doing a lot of passive solar design gets used, where we bring the light in, but we don't actually have the direct sunlight coming in here. We actually set up some interior wall. We call it a trom wall. It has a lot of thermal mass. It could be concrete. It could be barrels filled with water. It could be just something that's going to absorb a lot of solar radiation and then re-radiate out in space. So another strategy. A third strategy, which we don't use often enough is to actually think about actually even having a sunroom or a greenhouse or some sort of space where, yeah, it's incredibly hot in there, but what its purpose is is to kind of capture that energy and then give us some warm air that we can then use to go ahead and keep the rest of the space. So that's a possibility. Too. Lots of different possibilities in terms of thinking about how you can use this stuff. Okay. Then you get this whole issue of solar shading and all the different ways you can do solar shading. And we'll actually take a look at that in Revit and kind of figure out how you can incorporate those things. But before we do that, let me start with this. Let's go ahead and oh, let's kind of take a look at uh, four different conditions that I think are sort of worth looking at. There's sort of the whole notion of really the space and really what we want to do in the space, what we have to guard about in the space um, at different times. And, just to sort of illustrate this, let me go ahead and make a uh, simple little structure up here. And we'll go ahead and put some glass over here. And let's think about this simple structure at four different times and really what we have to go through and play with. Okay, so we have both heating and cooling periods of the year. That's something to kind of get used to. There are times when we need to heat the space because it's cool outside and we need to bring the temperature up. There are times when we want to cool the space. So one of the big issues is really, you know, are we heating or are we cooling? Okay. 
Another issue that we sort of have to think about is really, you know, is it night or is it day? Which is really about the issue, is there sun or is there not? Okay, so, you know, you have different things you want to kind of consider in each of these different times. So let's go ahead and kind of look at the one that we always tend to think about, which is this notion of heating. We want to go ahead and heat and when there is sun, because that's actually the one most people start with. We're always kind of designing for that one. And let's think about what's happening in here. So what's happening out here is basically, it's cold out here. Okay. And we'd like it to go ahead and be warmer in here. So this space in here, we'd love it to stay, oh, you know, 70 degrees or something like that. You know, we have some comfortable temperature. It's cold out here. We'll just say it's 32 degrees out here. Fahrenheit, like that. So. Let's think about how each of these different forces is working towards us. Oh, we'll also get to put the sun in the sky. We need that. So we do have some sun kind of hanging around over here. Okay, and it's kind of casting some rays that are kind of coming on down and acting on our building. Okay, so what's happening from a conduction standpoint right now? We got this space kind of hanging around out here. We got this cold out here. You know, what's happening in terms of wh which way is the heat going right now? Yep, it's going out. So... Conduction, it's radiating out, or it's conducting out to the roof, it's conducting out over here, it's conducting out to the glass, probably a whole lot more because the glass typically has a much higher U value or lower R value. Okay, so conduction, we tend to be losing heat that way. What's happening in terms of the solar radiation? Let's talk about that. That solar radiation is coming on down, it's hitting a couple different surfaces, it's hitting this roof surface. Okay. And a couple different things are going to happen as it hits this roof surface. If this roof surface has thermal mass, okay, it's going to start storing up that radiation and act like a battery. Okay, so it'll start filling up and this will get very, very warm with radiation. And then what will happen is that will radiate down into here and it'll also radiate up. Okay, how about through the glass? The glass can hit the glass. Does glass rate, does it store any? Actually, a little, but for most intents and purposes, the sun's pretty much coming right on through. It's going to warm up this surface, okay, and then it's going to radiate back out through the day. Okay, so you yeah, have radiation, conduction, it's all kind of working together, thermal mass. Yeah, we understand how this works. Okay, let's go ahead and change the equation. Okay, let's go ahead and say that instead of heating, we want to be cooling instead. So now, we will make it 90 degrees out there. So on our conduction side, what's happening there? So we got all this hot air on the outside. We have the cool air on the inside. All this heat's trying to creep in through the walls. It's coming this way at us now. It's trying to heat up that space. Same thing over here. It's trying to heat it up going in that direction now instead. Okay, so it's kind of working against us. If we left it alone, ultimately that box would probably get up to 90 degrees and that would be happening. Okay, what's happening in terms of the sunshine? Sunshine, it's still coming on down. Whether we want to heat or cool, it's still coming down and beating down on my roof. So that roof is absorbing heat, okay, and it's going to sort of radiate it into the building, kind of working against us. So we got some choices. Let's think about how we can do that. We talked about a couple things. In terms of that roof, if we don't want it to radiate so much, okay, what can we do? We can go ahead and put in some sort of a radiation barrier. Okay, we've talked about a couple ways to do that. There's the whole notion of what's called a cool roof, where you put the barrier on the outside, we make it all white, shiny, so it can't sort of radiate. When you do that, this doesn't heat up. Okay. And then um, you don't get the effect of it. And a cool roof, good for you in the summer, kind of work it against you in the winter. Okay, so, you know, it's a trade-off in there. You've got to figure out really what is the problem you need to solve. The other thing we can do is, and they actually make us do this on residential structures now. Okay. They actually make us put a radiant barrier on the inside of the roof, not on the outside. So what happens is if you ever see a house being built and they're putting the roof plywood on, okay, 
they'll often be, it's a shiny reflective, it almost looks like aluminum foil on the inside. And what's that all about? That's doing that same sort of thing. The radiation's coming on down, it still manages to heat up the roof because the shingles, they absorb energy, the plywood absorbs a little bit of energy. But what happens is that radiant barrier basically says, as much as that wants to come down and hit the house, it's gonna reflect back. It's not gonna get in and it keeps the attic cooler. So that's what a radiant barrier is all about. Okay. How about, oh, the sun that's coming down through all my windows. Okay, let's think how we block that. So if all the sun coming down through my windows is gonna heat up that floor and then ultimately start heating the house, working against my air conditioning system, my cooling system, okay, how are we gonna defeat that? So different ways we could approach that. We could go ahead and kind of make solid walls. Okay, that'll block out an awful lot of sun in terms of what's going on. If you prefer all that glass, what other things can we do to keep all that sun from getting in the house? Overhangs. Overhangs. Overhangs is the most classic one. People do this all the time. It's actually a very nice, simple thing. Go ahead, extend the overhang on out there to whatever, and let's think about how far it has to be. My sun's gonna low in the sky here, but if I'm trying to keep the sun out, that means I basically have to have an overhang that looks like that. I want no sun. So the overhang length is determined by how the sun's hitting it. Now because of this principle, if you come up to a house and you see that it has even overhangs on all four sides, what does that tell you about the quality of the solar design? Yeah, see, it's not. Yeah, I see you shaking your head there. It's, it means they didn't actually think about it very carefully. If the overhangs are even, you know, you really haven't thought about it very carefully because you need the overhang on the south side. You don't necessarily need it on the north, east, and west side. So you got to think about where it is relative to the sunshine. So you know, only really go ahead and, and from a sunlight shading standpoint, think about the overhangs, you know, just really on the south side. That's the important part. Now, if you don't like gigantic overhangs that look like this, and you'd like to consider another strategy, okay, we talked about some of those other ones. Shelving on the windows. Say again? Shelving on the windows. Exactly. Some sort of shelf in there. So again, we have this issue where, okay, Sun's coming on down, it's trying to get in. We don't have to worry about that first chunk. It's this amount of sunlight right there that we're sort of worried about. So what do we gotta do? We gotta block it somehow. And that's where this whole notion of, okay, you're gonna put it there, I wanna block that out. I gotta go through and put some sort of shelf in here. Okay, that'll block out a certain amount. Uh, you could put a gigantic one in there to try and block it all out, but the way a lot of it gets done now is, okay, that one's coming on down, so what do I need here? I basically need another one here. And then that one's gonna block out some sun, so again, I trace on down, and then I need another one here. And that's how it's really done. It's really just sized, you know, you know the length, the distance, you can sort of see that there's a relationship between the length of this in terms of how far it goes out and the distance between because ultimately it's just determined by the geometry. So we just basically need to set those up so it'll block it all out. You know, and that's basically how it works in terms of trying to do that. If you block the solar radiation here, it doesn't come in here, it doesn't get to the point where it can heat up that floor so you don't have the problem of kind of re-radiating it in there. Okay. The nice thing is you can still get the daylight in but you're like blocking out the heat when you don't need it. But the cool thing is, and again, we talked about earlier, in the winter time when the sun's much lower in the sky, what tends to happen is the sun can still get through and do the heating that you want to do it. So that's the basic principle of all that stuff. Okay, let's go ahead and shift this around to nighttime because nighttime's a little bit different in terms of what's going on. So what happens at nighttime? No sun. Okay, let's go to the cooling scenario first. So at nighttime, what happens? At nighttime, what happens in most areas is, okay, even in the cooling season, what tends to happen, 
it'll drop. Instead of being 90 degrees, you know, I don't know, maybe it's going to drop down to 70 degrees or 65 or something like that. It'll tend to drop to be a little bit lower than what's comfortable. So what do we want to do at that point? Okay, so what's happening with the conduction at that point? So, yeah, because this is probably heated up in here, so great. The heat's radiating out again, at least that's heading in the right direction in terms of what's going on. So we'd like to be able to, to conduct it on out. That's kind of cool. You know, all the heat that's stored up in here, we really don't have a radiant effect at this point. We don't have kind of sunlight coming in. Okay, but... Okay, we got this nice cool air outside and well, we can sit around and wait for all this heat to conduct out through the walls. Because we've done such a great job of insulating our walls, it's probably gonna take a long time for it to get out through those walls. Okay, so what do we gotta do to go ahead and help this out a little bit? You know, what are our others, how can we cool off this house other than like uh, kind of leaving the air conditioning turned on? Yeah, open a window. So beautiful. So we need to have hopefully some operable windows that'll open up. Mm -hmm. And okay, so if I'm going to put some windows in here that are going to open, is there a better place for the windows? I got all this hot air on trying to get out of here. A lot of hot air up here. But if we have a lot of hot air in our house and we were trying to get it out of the house, is there a better place for the, uh, to put the, uh, yeah. Oh, I, I see a finger. And it's saying, put it up high. Yes. So in terms of trying to have an operable window, good places are, oh, like right up in here. This is a great place in there. Way up high is a great place. Because in terms of all that hot air, it's trying to rise and we'd love it to do that and kind of go out. Another fantastic thing, anyone from the Midwest? Does anyone live in a house that has an attic fan? Yeah, attic fans are kind of really cool things. Yeah, it's really kind of a nice, simple concept. It's basically, you know, this is kind of cool, but actually if we just had, it could be a skylight, it could be some sort of active fan in here, whatever it is that's going to go in here to basically take all that air and pull it out here. Again, that's a very effective place to put it. Put it up high and kind of pull it out. Okay, a really cool thing even happens with attic fans that's really kind of nice is, okay, let's talk about this. If you have an attic fan and you're trying to blow all the hot air out up here, okay, super, we can, but we can really only pull out as much air as we release or we put back into the house at the same time. So this is a mistake people will do. They'll put on the fan, they'll keep all the windows closed, and there's really only so much air it could pull out at that point. So if I would like to pull in all this fantastic 65 degree air, into the house and I'm trying to like push it out to the top, you know, where else should I put a window? Yeah, that's the other good place to go ahead and basically have some sort of windows in here. So it's kind of interesting whether we're going to do it with an active fan or whether we're really going to do it with just some sort of passive convection system. It's actually incredibly helpful to have the cool air coming in and exhausting out the top side, something like that. So when you start seeing these windows that are way high and way low, that's what's going on. You know, there's always this funny thing about should you open all the windows or should you not? And it actually tends to be more effective to open just some very strategically located windows so that you can really draft it. Because another thing that'll happen in here is, oh, if you create the right feeling of the draft, even though it may be temperature-wise warm, it'll be more comfortable to the people inside the place. So you like to control that. Okay, so cooling sort of a very different thing. That after sun's kind of a very interesting thing. How about like if we're back to the heating cycle? What's different about it over on that side? So, okay, so once again, oh, actually it's not all that similar. Yeah, great. So it's seven degrees in here. It's nighttime. It's winter time. It's nighttime. Oh, it's bad. It's you know it's fifteen degrees out here. Okay, what are we gonna have to do about the heating now? So, the heat radiating out still. We don't have that sun. We don't get any of the solar energy in terms of going on. You know, what can we do at nighttime in terms of uh, in these heating months? Yeah, to kind of combat that. Yeah, is there anything we can do? Is there anything we should do with the windows? Close them. <laughs> That's probably the best thing to do is close them. Or another thing you can do, 
which is very effective. We sort of underestimate it a little bit is, you know, with all this glazing and stuff like that, yeah, we do tend to have things like uh, curtains and blinds and things that, like that that we can close. And actually, they're incredibly effective for this in that, you know, when you go through and have them in here, yeah, you're actually basically, oh, what is it? Yeah, they're actually, they're adding another thermal insulative layer. Because, you know, instead of all that um, uh, heat going out like this, you know, maybe by going through this, it's only going to go that, you know, it's, it's smaller. It actually cuts it down quite a bit. So it actually is sort of incredibly effective to go ahead and have blinds like this. Just talk about one other effect with this, and then I'll kind of show you how, how this all works in Revit. Yeah. Does anyone live in a house that has aluminum windows? I do. Like a lot of houses that were built, you know, more than a few years ago have aluminum windows. Yeah. You familiar with those? Like the, 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 the metal windows? Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that and how comfortable it is. Okay, so you're in this house with metal windows. Okay, they're over here. Okay, yes. As you start getting close to the window, okay, there's a temperature, but really the temperature is pretty much primarily determined as an air temperature here. But have you ever noticed with the aluminum windows when you get up close, it's almost like they're, they're sucking the energy right out of you? Okay, and they are. You know, because actually, you know, through that aluminum, all this energy is radiating through. So it sounds kind of weird, but you know, you are a radiant source. You're actually radiating all this energy. If you get to a, through a you know, close to a window, basically, without the curtain, your energy radiates right out. It doesn't get so reflected and stopped in any way because you know you have this low conduction. There's very little barrier to, to the glass. It will radiate right out through the glass. So it creates the impression that you're really very, very cold. So it sounds kind of you know incredibly obvious, but there really is a difference to like closing your blinds or closing you know, and it's not just for the temperature. It actually has to do with it's not just the conduction; it's just you radiating out, and whether you're radiating out very fast and losing all that heat, you're kind of keeping it. In. So really interesting stuff. It's uh, you know, it's very very complex how it all sort of works together. But given all that, let's talk about how you model some of that stuff because that's what you're going to do. Is actually go through. And try to do some of this modeling and kind of think about it. 